Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Ramos Law Difference Makers podcast, where I, your host, Dr. Jim Hoven, get the chance to meet with incredible people doing incredible things at multiple levels. And today is absolutely no exception. Today, I have the honor of meeting with someone who has spanned a successful career, not only in film, which is where he's at most recently, but also in business and in education and in politics. That is quite the, the diverse <laughs> scope. So I don't even want to hide anymore who this is and, and hold the curtain down. I want to pull the curtain up on my guest today, and that's Mr. James Mejia. Welcome to the show, James. Thank you for joining me. J- Jim, thanks so much for having me. I, I look forward to the conversation. And uh, with with a background like that, it, I, I think it shows two things. Number one, I can't keep a job. And number two, <laughs> number two I'm getting really old. So Well, I'll tell you what. I have looked through, and this is probably around our, by the time this episode drops, about 110 episodes-ish that we've done. And I can't say that I've seen many more resumes <laughs> that have the vast experience and incredible depth that yours does. I am so excited to, to dig into all of this. But first, just to give the people a quick sense, you've gone literally, so you grow up here, right? Uh-huh, grew and up then, in Denver. Yep. And then you went to, was it ASU first? Uh, or, University of Notre Dame undergrad. Oh, undergrad uh-huh. Notre Dame. And uh-huh. then Arizona where, State for my MBA. And then Princeton. And then Princeton for a master's in public policy. Yeah. Oh my so. goodness. So, so with all of that, you can tell it just if you're listening where this thing has gone between Notre Dame and ASU and Princeton, you love learning. You, you love education or you were so driven into these different yeah. areas that it kind of pushed you there. What were you like as a, as a kid before we go into what you're doing and how you've gotten <laughs> to this place? As a child, were you were you kind of the overachiever type? Was it all about the school? Were you involved in music? What was the thing? Yeah, you know what's funny is that I, I'm from a family of educators. So my father taught high school, public high school, for 37 years at West, and my mother had a daycare in our home. Wow! And so, aside from raising 13 kids in our home, I'm number nine of 13. But aside from raising all of us, she had a daycare in our home. So. Families in the Park Hill neighborhood of Denver, many, many of their children came through our our house, and uh, wow, you know, with a with a a founding like that of of uh, educator parents, the conversation really wasn't about whether or not you're going to be educated. The conversation is about where you're going to college and what you're going to study and what's interesting to you. And you know, the one thing I learned from my mom is that you should always have fun while you're learning, and learning is always fun. Uh, and so, you know, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I, I do enjoy learning and, and uh, try to consider myself a, a lifelong learner. Um, like to be learning new things all the time. And um, certainly, certainly now in the, in the film capacity, I, I, am, I am learning quite a bit. So I'll bet. Well, we're going to have to connect you with Gabe, our video producer here, because Gabe's claim to fame is he basically watches a movie a day. He is a movie buff of foreign films, of international, everything. So we'll have a a great talk on that. Excellent. But I got to tell you, um, my dad went to West High School, graduated in 67, I think, 67 or 66. I wonder if your dad would have been a teacher for him Probably, probably. Isn't that something? Yeah, probably. Wow, that is so cool. Yeah. Now, And you're also from a big family. Yeah, yeah. Ninth of 13. Ninth of 13. It was a baker's dozen at your house. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, and and... well, it, that might sound chaotic. My mother was actually extremely organized and orderly. She was very, very quiet, efficiently quiet. Uh, so always moving very quickly, but in a in a very quiet, uh, zen like state. So it was a it was a great it was a great way to to grow up. With, and then did you have kids around from the daycare? Oh with, yeah, oh, with all thirteen oh, God, of you plus, uh, plus other were, kids. There were kids everywhere. I mean, I, there there was always someone to. Uh, to go outside and, and, and play with. And um, there were always some sports games going on and some board games going on and, and homework at the kitchen table. And um, it, it, was a, it was a great environment in which to grow, to grow up. Are, is your family all bilingual speakers? Or? Uh, you know, it's interesting. When, when my mother was growing up in northern Colorado and, and her, she and her siblings had grown up picking beets in the fields of northern Colorado. Spanish was highly discouraged. And um, so by the time that she had raised us or, or brought us into the world, 
she did not teach us Spanish. She had lost the ability to, to speak Spanish. So it's not like today where I think there's a much greater value and emphasis placed on on being bilingual yes. than it was literally, in some cases, beaten out of uh, people who, who were monolingual Spanish speakers or, or bilingual. Um, so my older siblings didn't learn. Um, I didn't really accept that when I was in school. And uh, I studied abroad in, in Mexico City, um, junior year of, of college, and um, made it normal or made it uh, uh, important to speak Spanish in, in, in our family again. So I, Oh, so uh, you so, brought so it I, back? I brought it back um, to the extent that my younger siblings are, were much more uh, versed in Spanish, including a younger brother who also studied in Mexico. Um, but now my, you know, all three of my girls are fully bilingual. We lived in Uruguay. We spent a summer in Costa Rica. We've been to Mexico. So it's, you know, for for them, they're they're all on their third language as teenagers, and uh, that's that's the way I wanted it. I, I wanted them to be able to open doors through another language and through other cultural experiences that uh, that is allowed when 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 you have that kind of background. I so. love that so much, and you know, the reason that I asked is I know that you were part of in the education process bringing the first kind of bilingual Montessori program into the, in yeah, the Denver system, true. right? Yeah, that yeah. Um, which is funny because two of my three daughters ended up going to that school. So we we drove from across town to go to uh, Anna Marie Sandoval, in, uh, which is a dual language Montessori in North Denver. Um, and so they had half their day in English and half their day in Spanish. And... Uh, you know, that makes a difference. Such a difference. Yeah. Would you say that your first love as you were growing up and coming into the college area when you're at Notre Dame, was it the education side? Was it politics or was it business? Where, where did it start before it morphed into this huge mushroom of what your careers become? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, more, more on the business side of things. Like my, my undergrad is in marketing and I always knew I wanted to have the ability to navigate the business world. So, so that was probably first for me. I knew I wanted to write at some point in my life, do some journalism like my mother had done. Um, and, uh, but, but also know the business world and be able to, to, to navigate in that world. Um, the politics didn't come into, into, into play until well after MBA school when wanting to do international business and international trade I, I got, got a job at the state of Colorado in the governor's office of international trade. Um, but then what I really fell in love with was not only that is international business side was also government and, and serving the community through public service. Um, and, and then a switch over to the city in government. Then I found my true pace and that was the, the quickness of, of implementation of policy uh, and programs it's at the city government level. And I, you know, to this day for me, the executive branch among the three and municipal level government, in my opinion, is by far the most exciting in our entire governmental system. Well, and I know you love that cause you actually ran for mayor of Denver, uh, right? And I, what I, I understand, by the uh, way, you finished third in the closest race Ever. <laughs> that 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 is true. There were three of us that were were within. Uh, I, th- I, I want to say one and a half percentage points of each other. Yeah, of nine. Wasn't there a group of nine or something? There were uh, six. There were like ten. There were ten. Ten on, ten on the ballot. Um, yeah. So three of us were ver- were viable, um, and and missed the the runoff uh, narrowly. Um, yeah, that was a that was an interesting process. What was that experience <laughs> like? I I was. Um, we did a show with the mayor of North Glen. Okay. And super interesting, Nor- but North Glen's, North Glen's 40,000 people, yeah. and Denver is a little different animal, yeah. and so I don't know yeah. what it was when you were running the population, but it was certainly in the millions. Yeah. And what was it, what was it like? What did you find through the political process? Did, was it worse than you thought as far as the running? Was there dirty politics? Did people switch around? Was it, was it easier? Like, what was that part of your life like? You, you know... The first thing I would say was it's it's incredibly consuming. So so the the number of hours, 
you know, it's, it, it's hard to even fathom, but I was working 18 hours a day for an entire year and I, and I, and with, without, without being compensated for any other work, I essentially was running for mayor. I was running for office and, and so very consuming. The biggest hit was the time spent with my kids. And that for me was incredibly difficult. Like, like spending time with my girls is, is nourishing to my soul. It, it kind of, it, it, it feeds, you know, why I'm on this planet and, and, you know, wanting to provide for them, wanting to just spend time with them. And, uh, and it was hard. So it was hard in that, in that regard, not spending as much time with, with, uh, with my little ones. Um, but in, but in terms of, you know, I, I had kind of grown up in, you know, watching Mayor Webb navigate the political system in Denver. And were you on the inside where you were watching it, not watching it like I was, where I'm just a citizen, like you were, you were seeing what that was all about. Yeah, I was in three different positions and ended up as, as manager of Parks and Rec in his cabinet. So I was able to see as a uh, kind of a, uh, a smaller department head and then ending up as one of the, the biggest, you know, departments um, as, as head of that in his cabinet. And so, you know, being able to, to see him operate in city government, I learned what I would do the same, what I would do differently, um, where he was most effective, how it worked with his own personality and, and those, those lessons. I also saw Federico Pena operate, um, in the international realm, um, when he was the former mayor of Denver, uh, but we we had done a lot of work between the city and the state uh, during the NAFTA years and trade and trying to attract business to Colorado, et cetera. And then finally, um, you know, I, I I also served in a political appointee position under Hickenlooper. So same thing, able to see what I would have done the same, what what I would have done differently, and and watched how their own personalities came through in how they implemented policy. So it. You know, I was a student of the executive branch at the municipal level for uh, for a pretty long time. You know, you you would have been an interesting, um, almost a, a zebra in a world of horses, is what I sense. And you and I haven't spent any time together other than hanging out here. But I know because of your MBA background, a lot of politicians are attorney background first, right? That's true. And yeah. so you have your MBA background. Do you feel like? Um, your where you're at gives you a unique perspective and, and you're not even in that world anymore. But as you were there, the MBA side, the business side, it reminds me of when Ross Perot was wanting to yeah. look at running for president. And he said, look, let me look at this from a different thing. And then Trump saying, oh, well, hey, man, I'm a business guy. I can help the country run. Was that your perspective as you were in it or were you not in that depth of business yet like you were when yeah. you went to Pan American? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, um, I certainly had the perspective of business training and background, and it was very helpful to have that background coming into city government. It, it, um, you know, I really worked on startups and turnarounds in, in city government um, and, and the nonprofit realm. And what I found is having a background in business always applied and always hmm. helped. And whether it was marketing or management or finance or the accounting aspects, it was all very helpful. And, and more than anything, you study the right questions to ask. And even, even if you are not the person implementing, you're not creating the accounting system, you should at least know how that accounting system works, what the ramifications are for the rest of the organization, how it affects the budget, et cetera. That was really helpful. That was a very helpful background to have in city government um, and going right in and being able to read budgets and being able to, to look at the financial impact and, and those kinds of things. At the same time, though, I, I think, uh, especially uh, at the level of city government, you have to have, to, to be completely effective, you have to have the perspective of being a steward, of, of being a, a, a servant of the people, um, you know, in that city. And I think that the best executives, the, the, the best executive branch uh, representatives are those that have a balance between a perspective on being efficient through a business lens, 
but then also having compassion, empathy, understanding of what people are going through on a regular basis. And, and that mix and that balance, uh, in my opinion, is incredibly important to be effective. So, is, it, is it hard to have that balance in politics the higher you go? Because then there's more masters that you're serving, right? You've got this people donating yeah, this. And yeah. did you find that? Because I wonder, here's what I've always said about politics at the, at the, at least at the governor, and I'm not politically active, especially. So I, this may be totally false from the governor to the president, you go in saying you want to do something. The system's set up for checks and balances, yeah. but also all of a sudden it seems like getting into office almost guarantees making a liar out of every one of those people because they can't possibly <laughs> fulfill all the promises that their intentions were at because of political pulling and pressure. It, I mean, that's the perception of we, the standard yes. American people. Yes. Do you see that as you were watching it? Yeah, there, there certainly is that factor that in order to stay in office, there are those that have special interests and many of those special interests influence elections. And you have to determine where your lines are, where your bright lines are. What kind of money are you going to take? What kind of money are you not going to take? Um, I remember making the decision during the election. Uh, I think I had about 30,000 on the table with regard to uh, someone who owned a bunch of strip clubs. And I didn't, I didn't take the money. Um, and that, that was not necessarily something we really talked about yes. as, a, as a kind of a campaign team or a campaign <laughs> staff. It, it was more, just more of a reaction to, right. I've got three girls. Do I want to go home and tell them where all this money came from? You know, it, it was more just a, a, a personal feeling at the time. Um, and, and frankly, I, I, I go back in my mind from time to time and revisit, you know, it, it, it is a, a legal business and um, everyone belongs in government. And why should that be any less influential than someone else or some other special interest? So, you know, there, there are a lot of questions, but you have to figure out where your bright lines are. You know, are you gonna, that. Are you going to take money from, uh, from those that would damage the climate? Are you going to take money from those that uh, um, take advantage of, of uh you know, the, the prison population. I mean, where, where are your lines as a person with ethics? Wow. Yeah. You know, what, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And, and you've got to be prepared to have those conversations. Number one with yourself and number two with your family and, and number three with the team that's supporting you to, to get elected. So it, it's a, it's a pretty fascinating world. Yeah. And people wouldn't think about that, right? Just to, I'm sure the average listener here Baby hasn't gone that deep into it. And the only thing I can relate to that once is, you know, my partner and I had five chiropractic clinics, right? And so we were always out hustling, hustling, yeah. hustling to, to get new business. Because as chiropractors, it's not like we're on staff at hospitals with patients flooding. And right. We have to go generate what we're going to do. Right. And so um, I had told, told my partner, I said, look it. I'll, I'll go make some stuff happen. I got this. Don't worry about it. And so I'm out hustling around and I went into a strip club and I said, look it, how many people work here? Good guy says 260 or something. I'm like, uh, wow, I'd never guess. I said, yeah. well, you know, we got an office here. We'll, we'll take care of your people. We'll do this and that. So we start this relationship. Next thing I know, the guy calls in and says, hey, I'd like to invite you guys on the ski trip, da, 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 blah, blah, blah. And then he says, and by the way, we're going to put a, a, when the newspapers were doing the big advertisements, remember yeah. a, a full page ad was 15 grand for the Sunday on the newspaper. He's like, we're going to put in the, the great shamrock, um, great shamrock day strip off sponsored by such and such bar and lifetime health and wellness. And my partner's like, no, 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 no. Cause you know, he's a good Christian guy. And we had a lot of Christians coming into our, into our, um, our practice. And so we were like, whoa, 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 this is too far. We wanted to take care of your team because you know, Strippers have spines too, right? right? As right, do the bouncers right, and the, right. the door guys and everyone, yeah. the cooks, everyone, we're just hunting up business. Well, then once they wanted to take it to that level, we literally had to make a decision that said, what's our, what's our business purpose? What's our business reputation versus taking the money as you Yeah, and, and what, are your, what are your personal ethics that, that drive the bright lines Absolutely. as to what's acceptable and what's not? Yeah. So yeah. That, was, that was fascinating. Yeah. Um, fascinating time. So I can only imagine what it was like at, at that level. Yeah, yeah. What about when you start looking at the business side, because you and the business side were helping connect the dots between getting businesses connected with government 
and investments and money and brand development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was through your MBA work as getting that information in your head. Right. Was that, was that then what you'd seen in government made you think, ah, I can connect those dots to help businesses. Is that where that came from? Oh yeah. I mean, one, one, one thing that that's, that was obvious then and, and, and remains to be very obvious to me is that when number one, there's a lot of business to do with governments. You know, when, when, when I was running for mayor, that was a billion dollar budget. Now it's much more than that. Um, you know, that's probably grown by 30, 40% at the city level. Wow. Um, you know, when I was on the Denver school board, that was a billion dollar budget. And so there's a lot of business to do with governments. Um, and, and number one, many businesses don't understand all the procurement that governments need. But, um, yeah. Cause you think construction, right? Yeah. Oh, construction contracts to build a stadium and to do roads and to do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you don't think of, there's all this answers of billions of dollars. I've oh, yeah. never known that. Oh yeah. No, they're billion dollar businesses and, and, and some of the largest employers in, in the area. Um, you know, so, so that's a, that's a, that's a major factor, um, uh, of, of being able to connect business to government and just saying, there's a lot of business there. This is worth your while. And then helping them with the language of government and how really to connect with the right people in government. So that, that's an unknown quantity, I think, to it, to a lot of businesses. So, um, yeah, that kind of came naturally, how to, how to bridge the gap between business and government. It, that, that, that's something I've, I've been able to, uh, to, to do throughout my career and, um, you know, kind of made a consulting practice out of it. Yes. So, yeah. and that was the Pan American. Was that the yeah, consulting yeah, business yeah. where you were working with that? Correct. Incredible. When, when you look at that business, was that, was there some connection there between that and then you managing the creation of the, the Denver, when you were project manager of the, the Denver, what did we call it? The, well, the justice center, the justice center. Um, Cause that's, that's a huge project. What is it? 425, $450 million project that yeah, you Yeah. 425 million, a uh, million square feet of, um, uh, of new construction in downtown Denver. Um, yeah, we built a, built a 35 courtroom courthouse and a 1500 bed detention facility and a, uh, we built a post office, a U.S. post office, and a uh, parking garage. So it was, it was an interesting project that took about five years uh, uh, of time and in and, and probably ten years of my life. And, uh, <laughs> you doubled down on yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that so many stakeholders in in that from from judges to the sheriff's department to the police department to the uh, district attorney to the public defender's office. Um, to the general public, uh, it was, it was a city council, the mayor's office, all constituents with regard to what was happening on that project. So that was, was a great learning, learning experience. Um, the advantage there is I, I got to form my own team, uh, from one day to the next, it was essentially me and an intern. And then we had an election, uh, to pass a bond issue and had, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to build this project and had to staff up, uh, create partnerships, um, create political, uh, alliances to make sure everything got through. And eventually, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what year we completed, but that was the, uh, the last large city project on, on time and on budget. So very proud of that effort. Absolutely. And, uh, How did you, where did you move from to that position? Were you in government and got switched out to that? What was that transition period when you started that process? Yeah, no, I, I did. I did uh, the mid-career master's in public policy at Princeton. So I, 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 um, I left city government when Webb left. I, I wanted to, to kind of make a clean break with him. And I had a couple different options on the table. I was actually interviewing for a for a White House fellowship. I made it to the to the national final round. Uh, there were twenty of us, and they took twelve. So I was very close on that. And then um, my plan B was to go to Princeton. So I, I I had been accepted into Princeton and and took that opportunity. And and that that was spectacular in in two thousand and three. When I finished, I actually did not want to get back into government. I actually did not. I, you know, I was looking to do some different things. But uh, then Chief of Staff Michael Bennett, now U.S. Senator. Yes. 
and then mayor, uh, now Senator Hickenlooper, uh, both talked to me about about doing the project um, because there was a lot of community work that needed to get done to lay the groundwork, and then um, a lot of business to actually get the project done. So, kind of a unique fit. Um, right place, right time. Uh, stars were aligned politically, and you know we we got it done. How do you? This I got to ask just because, again, the audience listening, I'm sure they're gathering. We're hitting snippets of something that's just really vast and amazing to me. Like yeah. this this podcast could go on for hours, but I promise I won't let it. Um, how did you know when it was time to do something different? Was there something in your soul that just told you? Was Did the next opportunity just show itself? Like, did you say, I'm sick of this? What What was the, the thought? Because you've, again, gone through yeah, so many a, transitions. That's a great question. Uh, I've never worked anywhere that I didn't want to be. I mean, just in, in my entire work life, I've, I've, never, I've never worked a place where I didn't want to be, where I wasn't learning something and, and enjoying myself. Um, you know, it's funny. I, 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 have four, I have four rules for my kids. Um, and my daughter reminded me, she was asking about the fourth one. Hey, Dad, you know, what's the fourth rule? <laughs> And, and I came to these four rules just kind of based on where I was. Yeah. Um, the, the first is, is always learn something, always be learning something. Um, the second is have fun. Uh, the third is try, always try your best. And the fourth is always give something back mm. to the community that you're in at the time. And uh, it, it's something that we've we've always talked about just as a family. You know, what what are the four things? And whether whether my kids were playing a soccer game or whether they were taking a test or um, whether they're doing a volunteer project, we always kind of go back to those four rules. And I say, hey, as, as, as long as you're doing that, I'm I'm proud of you. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what, what you decide to do, how you do it, et cetera. And, and I think... For, for me, those four rules have, have come throughout a career of making sure that everything is present in the places that I work. Giving your best presence there. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about this? This is, they've always said, and you know, so I grew up doing some athletic stuff, going to chiropractic school, getting out now, you know, helping the business side of a couple businesses that Dr. Ramos owns. And just like you, I find that I'm in my passion zone and I love what I'm doing. I'm in my strength zone. All this stuff is really good. There's this, this common concept of follow your passion, follow your passion, yeah. follow your passion. Yeah. And I was a hundred percent in. And then I heard from interestingly from Mike Rowe who was on a podcast that I was listening to. And he talked about following your passion. Yeah, you can get behind that, but what about bringing your passion to whatever you're doing? And yeah. then all of a sudden you become an expert at that and you can become passionate about that. And that really, yeah. man, James, that really opened my mind because like on the dirty jobs episodes that, that you see, a lot of those folks, they're passionate about their quote unquote dirty job, right. but they didn't start out that way. They just figured they got really good and served a niche. And then they're like, then they became proud and passionate right. for it. Have you ever noticed the difference between following your passions and being passionate? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that, that a great example of that is this position that I'm in now at Denver Film. Um, so I've always enjoyed film, but far from being a film expert, you know, no, no, one, no, one, no one would consider me a, a film expert. Um, we have film experts. That, you know, they're really good at their job. We have, we have two artistic directors. One, one uh, programs for the C Film Center, which we run year round, and the other programs for film festivals, we don't need another film expert. Like we, we, we have that already. Um, but I, I'd like to think I'm bringing my, my passion and expertise with regard to, uh, business foundations and community relations and collaborations. And that's what I'm bringing to, to the equation where we already have very good programming. And so yeah. that, that there's an instance, I think, of bringing my passion to the work. At the same time, however, I'm learning so much about film. I'm learning so much from the experts in film that I, I feel 
my passion for film growing at the same time. So and so, good. so I think it's a, it's a two way street. You can bring what your, your, your own current passion and, and bring that to the equation, but then there's always something to learn and there's always something to, to get more passionate about. And, and, and for me, it's, it's the two way street of, yeah, I'll bring my passion, but I'm also going to become more passionate about, about the subject matter and, uh, and, and film the, 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 the number of, uh, amazing films I've seen in the last year and a half is, is astounding. I, I've probably watched more film in the last year and a half than I have in the, in the, you know, previous two decades. And, and, uh, uh, it's, it's been wonderful to, to get a front row seat, you know, a front row theater seat to, uh, to the industry. Uh, so of, of good. Film. How did you transfer? Let's talk about Denver film. So you got, yeah. you were named CEO of Denver film yeah. and were you looking for that gig or did it like what, pa what interested you in pursuing that considering all the other stuff we've talked about yeah. has nothing to do with film. Yeah. So where yeah. did that come from? Yeah. It, you know, I was, I was not looking for a job. I was very happy in, in the, in the world of consulting that I was doing and, and making, making a very fine living and working with some business partners that I, I quite enjoy and are, are still very good friends, et cetera. Um, but the recruiter who was working on Denver film was the same recruiter who worked on the Denver preschool program. Uh, when I became the founding CEO of the Denver preschool program and, uh, a couple other people had asked me to look at the position because they knew that what they needed was a business foundation and kind of a, in, in a, uh, you know, looking at it as a rebirth or a renovation, um, you know, or, or, or a turnaround of some of those systems. Um, and that's, that's my background. That's what I've kind of done in government and out of government, private sector, nonprofit, startups and turnarounds. And I'm like, okay, this looks, this looks familiar. There are some really good things going on and some areas where they need some more help. The areas where they needed more help just happened to be areas that, it, that I could be passionate about and have some expertise in and, and add that to the firm. Um, and I've always enjoyed film. So it, it, the, the timing seemed quite right. And even though I looked at it a couple of times and said, yeah, that's interesting. Probably not me. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a film expert. When I understood that they didn't need a film expert, it's actually what they already had. Yes. Then, then I figured out it was a, it was probably a pretty good fit. And, and, um, and now I know it's a good fit. I, I, we have an incredibly bright future and, you know, whether you're looking at film on the rocks that we do up at red rocks or whether you're looking at our film festival that we have every November or some of these mini festivals for, uh, women plus film or, Dragon Boat, which is our next one in March, um, you know, it, it, it is both an enjoyable experience. It is a very steep learning curve, um, but an area that I'm very comfortable in providing a business foundation. So re really excited to be there. It's a great fit. We've got a very bright future. So excellent. What is the, so if people haven't heard of Denver film, can you yeah. describe the, the purpose, the vision or the mission of what Denver film is all about? Yeah. D D Denver film is, um, a, a nonprofit film society, uh, to bring independent film, um, and, and celebrate the diverse voices in that independent film and bring that to, to the state of Colorado. Um, so we're, we're the only year round operated nonprofit theater in the state, uh, the C film center that's on Colfax across the street from East high school. Um, and it, with our three house movie theater, we're, we're continually changing, uh, what we offer in terms of independent foreign cult classics, um, celebration of, of certain actors, including Sidney Poitier, who, who will be uh, featured next month at, at the sea. Think things of that nature. And so um, a, a nonprofit film society that is celebrating diversity and bringing that diversity to screens uh, throughout, throughout Colorado. And, and, bring, and is the, is the, maybe it's a twofold um, mission. Is it, so it's to bring the film, that's the product and the process is getting the film out there. Is it so that the independent folks get seen? Is it so that the community can appreciate something off 
Hollywood, so to speak, right? right Not necessarily right. a Hollywood production right. and get and, and somehow be moved by what film does or is there something along those lines? Is it a combination of those two? It, yeah, it's a com- combination of a few things. One, one, I would say we're bringing um, independent film, you know, and that would encompass, encompass foreign or even locally produced film. So give, giving a, um, a platform uh, to small filmmakers uh, that have a that have a product and an art to share with the community, um, supporting our local filmmakers. So making sure that Colorado filmmakers, if they're willing to, stay right here at home. Um, and you know, one of the ways we do that is is through our fiscal sponsor program, whereby those films, in the process of 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 making the film, use our nonprofit status to. Uh, to offer tax tax deductible donations, uh, those donations are made to a film. The film gets produced, and we help to screen and celebrate the the artistry and and uh, majesty of film that comes comes from from within our state right here. Um, so it's a it's a mixture of uh, of being a voice and offering a platform for those that might not otherwise be seen in the independent film scene. That's really cool because that we're all looking for right now. We're looking for ways to express, to be seen, to be heard. And I think what you're, what I'm hearing you say is that you're offering that for the artists, but you're also offering for me as, you know, I mean, I'm more of a sports watching guy, history channel yeah, guy, yeah, right? I'm more yeah. that kind of guy. Yeah. But if I wanted to broaden my horizons and see something completely unique and different to give me a different perspective of a film and be the world. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you describe yourself that way because I could completely identify. I mean, the reason the reason I have cable is two things: local news and sports. And, yeah. I, and I watch, <laughs> you know, I watch a lot of sports. Um, and then I, I find myself getting into the History Channel and, and National Geographic yes. and, and some interesting channels like that. But over the last year and a half, as I have discovered the unbelievable art that's coming to the big screen through film, through independent film in particular, and some of them from, from far flung places throughout the world. Now I'm really gravitated to that. And, and, and I noticed this year a little bit of a change cause I'm, I'm a, I'm a tennis guy. I grew up playing tennis okay. and, and so I keep track of the Australian open and, and uh, the French open and U S open and, and Wimbledon kind of, you know, watch all the majors religiously and, even some smaller tournaments in between. This year, when the Australian Open was on, it was it coincided with Sundance. Sundance was virtual, and I found I found my friends telling me what was going on in the Australian Open because I'm busy watching all this amazing cinema. And, wow! And and for the first, you know, I, I kind of sat there and said, "Well, I don't even know who's who's in the quarterfinals of the of the Australian Open." I'm watching amazing cinema and, That's and it was, it was, yeah, it's a, it, it, that was a, that was a switch that kind of took place this year. And it'll be interesting to see where, where the balance hits. Cause I'm, I'll always be a, a sports watcher. Um, but, but have, have discovered much more of the world of independent film and, and really have, have become drawn to that. When you see independent film, does it, fall into a certain type of categories that's super attractive. Like when we think about making content, when we think about this business or any business about making content, something I learned from a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk, also known as Gary V, a big celeb okay. in, in that area, okay. right? He basically talks about either content being made to educate or entertain. And after I thought about that, I said, yeah, that makes sense. And for me, there'd be one more too, and that would be to inspire. So educate, entertain, and inspire. And if yeah, you're doing yeah, it well, yeah. you might be able to combine two yeah. or maybe even three of those. Yeah. Is, is that the same? Is there a genre within the genres that most of these types of independent films, are they to educate, inspire, entertain, or some combination that you're seeing? You, you know, it, it's inter- that's a great question. And, and I think there is a combination of those depending the the one of the best things about it is is that they're they're so less formulaic than a big Hollywood blockbuster, you know the 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 hero, um, you know the storyline is one you've seen before, kind of the problem, the resolution, the yes. celebration, like you know many blockbusters kind of follow the the formula of of being successful, um, and and yet the unpredictability 
of some of this independent film is the very best part of it. Is that oh, I didn't see that coming. You know, you 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 watch something by the by the Spanish uh, director Almodovar or you know in the, in in Spike Lee's early days or you know you you just you just find some independent filmmakers that throw you a curveball and to me that's some of the more interesting viewing in independent film. Do you have a favorite that you've noticed recently? Something that just really popped out at you that none of us listening unless we're into that world would would know. Um. Th- there are two categories for me and one kind of going back to my viewing of history channel and national geographic. I'm a huge documentary guy. Me too. And Love. So, yeah. So there are two from last year that were my absolute favorites. Uh, one is a film called storm Lake, okay. which is about the storm Lake times out of storm Lake, Iowa. And uh, it's about this editor, art Cullen and his family that run this small newspaper that every candidate for president wants to get connected to because the paper is so high quality and, and I was such an important place in our political uh, atmosphere and um, they do such a great job. So showing, showing the importance of journalism, uh, the decline in readership um, the impact on politics, the importance as the fourth pillar and the check and balance on our democratic system. That was a, an astounding documentary to me. And I, and I consider a journalist like Art Cullen to be, a, to be an American hero. And so uh, that was one of my favorites from last year. Um, another was a film called Crimes with, with the K. And, and it's a, it was a film about Jesse Crimes, a documentary about a guy who, who ended up spending time in prison. But during the entire time he was there, he spent an average of 12 hours a day working on his art. Like a painting kind of art or? Well, you can imagine what, what your materi- materials are <laughs> when you're in prison. <laughs> Things like newspaper, yeah. glue, toilet paper, charcoal or, you know, burnt matches to come up with charcoal. So very limited resources. And here's a guy who spent 12, 12 hours a day for his entire time in prison, smuggled out small pieces, like eight by 10 pieces that all fit together in a mural that went across an entire wall and is now touring the country. Wow. So, and, and, and we'll come to Denver. So, so, you know, meeting someone like Jesse Crimes, I'm like, all right, this is not a, this is not formulaic. This, this is a guy who had issues. This is a guy yes. who went to prison. And his name is Crimes. Yeah. Jesse Crimes. How crazy is that? Yeah, crimes I, for yeah, crimes in prison. <laughs> go figure. And, 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 but here, but it's a, it's a story of redemption. Yes. It, it, it's one I think that a lot of people can identify with and, and show, how art emerges, you know, almost like a, like a flower growing through the sidewalk cracks or despite whatever the circumstance is, somehow art is like the healing factor. Art is the emerging art. Art is what feeds the soul. Art is what keeps you alive, you know, in, in a, in a depressing place, like an an oppressive place like prison. Um, And yet here's there, there, there is still a masterpiece to be created. And, And that to me was, such a relevant and important story about life and he's into prison reform. Wow. So, so, you know, he, he's, he's now out there working with other artists and, and talking about prison reform, having been there himself and, and, you know, able, able to talk about his experience and what should be changed. So, so, good. so, so you know, so a couple of, you know, American heroes, it, it's funny because a lot of people in, in the film industry are smitten by the actors and celebrities. For me, you know, I see Art Cullen and Jesse Crimes as subjects of these documentaries, and I'm like, those guys are American heroes. And that, you know, that to me was kind of the uh, some of the resonating. Do those resonating things make factors. it to Netflix? Those kind of independent films do they get picked up by those services so the rest of us can see them on on where we would find them easy? Yeah, they 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 will. Many of them will. Um, and so they'll, they'll either come out on a Netflix or an Apple or a, you know, one of the, one of these streaming services. Um, 
or they'll they'll kind of they'll try to push it out themselves. One of the roles of film festivals is to find these films, to bring them into the public sphere, and influence the amount of press and discussion that takes place around those films. And and if we if we do um, if we complete our role the way we should, we should be elevating film, independent film, to the extent that they are more well-known, more accepted, more marketable to a U.S. public. Um, and so one of the objectives for a film like that would would be, yes, you know, they, they would be streaming. They'd want to get picked up and then, and then seen by a lot more people around the country and around the world. That's great, man. That just blows my mind when, because I've seen some amazing and incredible documentaries on Netflix about just a, a variety of things that blow my mind. So it's yeah. so cool that they have that. I'm interested, and this may not be something that that you or the the Denver Film Group has been used to, but I know there's this big push towards NFTs now. Yeah. And the NFT yeah. world is really um, playing to the advantages of the independent artist yeah. where they don't need so many middlemen to do stuff. And where I've really seen it is in art and in music, but I don't know if NFTs, the non-fungible tokens for those that don't know what those are, if that contract is being done yet with these independent films, or is that something that hasn't quite moved that direction yet? You know, I've heard minimal conversation about it. Um, it, it has not been a full fledged movement uh, per se, but there's definitely been conversation about it. Um, and, and I have, I actually have an incoming board member who's, who's more well versed in NFTs and will be educating the rest of the board. And I, and I think the uh, the leadership on the, on the staff with regard to how it might play a role, you know, in, in, in film. And, and it is having a foothold in, in other industries. There's no reason to think that it won't be coming to film pretty soon. Yeah. I, so. I, I would agree. And I just think it's a great chance for you guys as kind of the, you're the champions of these folks to, you know, to understand and, and them now to be able to really win, right? right? I think that's cool. And I don't know much about it except that between social contracts and these abil these availabilities for artists to really grow their brand and their right. stuff and have it be theirs non-ending in perpetuity right. is, is really right. cool. Right, so absolutely. I, I got to ask you this, and I know, man, we've already been together 45 <laughs> minutes. This is so cool. What, um, is, is there any really specific business lessons, tenants, just guideposts that you would offer to people that would want to follow in your footsteps and either start something, try something, explore something that you would tell them, look, the, these are the, the things that you need to either really watch out for or really focus on. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I think about such things from time to time. And, and, and I started with, I've never worked a place where I didn't want to work. I mean, that, that just for me, that's a really important thing. I'm, I'm not as, you know, I, I've got to make ends meet. I have to, I have to make money, but that is certainly not my primary goal. If that were my primary goal, I would have, I would have stayed in hardcore private sector and, and kind of worked my way up there. For, for me, it was much more important to keep learning, to add something back to the community and to be real interested um, and to be passionate about it. Uh, frankly, um, those are the things those are the things that, that interest me and, and motivate me much, much more than, than just the dollars and cents. Um, so I would say you ha you, one should find what's most motivating for them. And for some people, it may very well be, be money. And I'm, you know, I'm not judging about that. But you've got to find what, what is that motivation and where are your levers? What, what's really going to excite you to get up in the morning and to get to work? And in my opinion when you are excited in the morning to get to work, you do a much better job. You're a much more pleasant person to be around. Uh, you're a much better teammate uh, for the rest of the team. And so why not find something you enjoy? Why not find something that, that really feeds the soul and, and speaks to you at the time? So I, I would say those things. Um, I would say it's, it's never bad to be efficient. Like you, you can always improve your processes in, in, in terms of being efficient. And whether you are selling Girl Scout cookies as a nonprofit or running a manufacturing business, efficiency is important. Efficiency helps you predict the future. Efficiency helps you manage your costs. Um, 
efficiency makes it easier for everyone to know what their jobs are, et cetera. So efficiency is not just a business idea. It's an idea that should permeate wherever you're working. Uh, take the frustration out of the process and just, you know, just being efficient about what, what and how, how you work. Um, and, and I would say at the foundation of any and all of this is a strong team and, and valuing, um, who works with you and who shares the common mission, um, to me is, is the most important thing, uh, second to, to nothing else. Um, because it, it's that team that's going to be implementing and one person can do just so much, but a team together can, can do, um, can, can really get the heavy lifting done. And so you got to reward that team and you got to make sure you're taking care of them. You got to make sure that, that they hear that the work being done is real important and, and, uh, you know, critical to mission. Um, so, that's that's one that I, that I I take to heart is is the team is at the center of of everything you do and make sure they're well taken care of and and happy and if not work on it together collaborate on making it better collaborate on making it a better place to work and and a more interesting place to work and a place to learn and you know a place to really feel fulfilled about the mission. Those are so strong. So basically, love what you're doing have a great team and make sure that you're being efficient. Like those are three great things. And, you know, I want to add something because it was really hitting me as you were talking on that first, that first part with, you know, it's better to go to work happy than not. Yeah. That said, sometimes you got to do a job that you don't like. Like, you know, sometimes I have to pick up dog poop in my yard because I got big dogs. That said, I can bring, I can make dog poop as good as picking it up can be the way I, the weather I bring to it, so to speak. Right. Yeah. And, and so what I find is I learned something from a mentor one time and, and basically he said, the sooner you can get money out of the way, the sooner that you can really start chasing the things that you want. And so to me, point. you know, if you, if you can't start out at a job that makes a bunch of money to get money out of the way, you have to look at going the opposite direction saying, okay, what do I really want and need in this life? And then I start saving and investing and planning so that I can get money out of the way without having to make a million bucks a year. Now I can get money out of the way and start chasing what I want. Have you seen that to be a factor? Oh, very much so, including my own life, you know, where, um, yeah, I, I, the, the better job you do at, at controlling your own personal finances and having some discipline about your own personal finances and living beneath your means does mean that that sacrifice that you're making at that time is something that it's investment, frankly, it, it's something that pays dividends down the line. It allows you to not have to worry about money when you see something you really want to do or take the trip you really want to go on right. or you pick up the hobby that you really want to do. I mean, th- there are some down the line dividends to early sacrifices and, and, yeah, I, I think that's I think that's an incredibly important point. Um, and and the the better you are at controlling and, and having some discipline in that regard, I I, th- I think the the more you'll enjoy it when it really will make a difference. And and you decide there's something you want, there's a there's a pool of resources to go after and get it. James, I can see in your face the the joy that you have for life, the passion that you have. Like you just kind of beam, right? Which is super <laughs> cool because you've done all these things and you're still just getting after it. And I just respect that so much. For my final question, is there, besides what we've already talked about, is there yeah. one piece of advice that someone gave you along the way that was that center post or that centerpiece that really drove you or that you've learned along the way and you shared a bunch of nuggets with us already in that regard, but is there something that we haven't talked about that you would as, as kind of a parting shot leave to our audience and to me yeah. that, that I can use and take with me? Um, you know, I would say it, it, it's not something that someone said. It's that it's something that two individuals demonstrated. And, and those were my parents and the way that they operated in their world of education was they knew what they were doing was some of the most important work on the planet. It's teaching the next generation. And they showed us how important it was to serve the community. 
And it certainly wasn't for financial gain. It certainly wasn't for fame and glory. It was for being a servant to this community in which you live. And that, you know, again, it's nothing my parents talked about. They didn't brag about it. Um, they just did it. They just kind of lived it. And, and you, you couldn't help but just kind of look at them. And I, I appreciate it much, much more now that, I, now that I'm older. Um, but I kind of look back and I think, my dad didn't need to coach all those sports. He didn't need to do all that extra GED volunteer work. He didn't need to be like the scorekeeper at all the games. He didn't, he didn't need to do all that stuff. But when you walk into the building where he was working and every single kid who's passing him knows his name, knows what he's about, has a comment, has a joke, that's, he, 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 lived, uh, he lived a way that I think is admirable. Powerful. And, and, and uh, you know, same with my mother. And, and that, that's something that, that I've always tried to emulate, frankly. Uh, James Mejia, what a great conversation. If people want to learn more about Denver Film and they want to support that effort and what you guys are building, creating, how would they reach out and connect? Yeah, our, our website is the best way to connect. Um, certainly as a, as a nonprofit, 501c3, we rely on the community for, for support. Um, and we're grateful for uh, the taxpayers of uh, the several county region that support um, SCFD, the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. We're a tier two there. Um, but our website is um, denverfilm.org. And, and uh, we'd love to see you at the, the film center uh, for, for an independent film. We, we're going to have a very interesting next several weeks with regard to our programming and a few exciting things and some changes there. And, uh, you know, Dragon Boat and Women Plus Film coming up in the next few months. So. I can't wait. I'm going to go down with Gabe, our video guy. He's going to take right. me down and show me the ropes as the All pro. Right. Maybe we'll great. see you down there at, at that, at the open house or something. That sounds great. That James, sounds great. thank you for the time today. Best of luck to you. And, and again, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. 